I'm Fred Hickman alongside Steve Bunin. The Little League World Series opened with this dramatic catch, and today, a finish just as dramatic. Highlights you've got to see. Not uh, quite such a dramatic finish for Team USA on the hardwood. Plenty of dunks, though, falling against the Canadian squad minus Steve Nash, which is sort of like listening to the Jackson 5 minus Michael. Sports Center is now. We're teed up. All right, this is Vegas FIBA America's tournament. Team US. A pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Now to baseball, Little League, United States Championship of the World Series. Lubbock, Texas in blue against Warner Robins, Georgia in gold. Dalton Carricker, top of the third, but put Georgia up 2-0. Same frame, same score. Now you got two runners in scoring position. And David Umphreyville, back of the box. Two more runs come in. It's four-zip Georgia. Bottom of the third, Texas got to get on board. One on, two out. And Greggy Hewitt's got 99 problems, but that pitch ain't won. First hit of the game for Texas. They pull within a couple of runs. They move ahead to the fourth. Still 4-2. Runners on second and third. Zane Ooh. Ansa. Whoops. That's going to cost you. Hunt Smith sliding into home. Ansel holds on to the ball, but goes down hard. Take another look. Now, this is Little League. Big heart. Holds on to the ball. Has to be helped off the field. Both teams on the bench. Round of applause for the kids. They play their hearts out. Bottom five. Bases loaded. Carricker in relief. Ball gets past Kendall Scott. Max Randolph headed home. Carricker makes the tag. Another great defensive play from the little guys in Pennsylvania. Same at bat. Still two runners in scoring position. Brendan Arredondo. Zane Conlon. That's nicely done. Georgia out of the inning. One more look to save a couple of runs. It would be a web gem if we had Little League World Series so. web gems. Bottom of the six tying run at the plate. Carricker fans Jay Pendergrass. And look out, Georgia going dancing for the second straight year. Coming out of the Southeast into the Little League World Series, trying to become the first repeat champions since the Chinese Taipei did so in the mid-90s. Question is, who would the international opponent be? Great game between Curacao and Japan to decide things. Bottom of the fourth, Japan down 3-2, first and second, two outs. Masaya Ogeno. Deep to center field, but watch Vincent and Tone or nothing. They're getting ready to turn left under the lights at Bristol, Tennessee, and there's a sale at Penny's. Now we could fill that up, and it might hold my kids for three days. <laughs> that, that's one shopping cart. Coverage begins as soon as Sports Center ends, right here on ESPN. You want to hit that in the parking lot? <laughs> Not good. All aboard the NFL preseason express from only one touchdown compared to three picks. The best scrambler the NFL has seen this decade has nowhere left to run. After agreeing yesterday in court to enter a guilty plea in the dogfighting case, Michael Vick was suspended indefinitely without pay by NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. The suspension puts Vick in violation of his contract, which means the Falcons can now go after Vick's $22 million signing bonus. ESPN legal analyst Roger Cossack joining us now on SportsCenter. Roger, there is still dissension as to what exactly Vic admits in the plea agreement. But what does the wording of the statement of facts tell you? Well, it's clear that what uh, Vic's lawyers uh, tried to do um, was to make this plea seem somewhat ambiguous. But I think there's no, there's no doubt that the legal meaning of the plea is, is that Michael Vick has admitted to gambling as well as admitted to participating in the killing and the execution of the dogs. Uh, there is reference in the gambling to two types of gambling. One is the side bets, which are bets that were placed by, I suppose, observers who were watching the dog fights among gave the money perhaps to someone else. But nevertheless, it's gambling. At least one legal analyst has already said Vic could have gotten this result without a lawyer at all. How would you grade Vic's defense team? Well, I think that uh, Vic's defense team... So what are the judge's options Monday? Well, the judge really uh, did the maximum sentence, even though I don't think that's going to happen. So in your experience, what role will Vic's cooperation play in how much time he ends up spending behind bars? Well, Michael Vick has agreed to be an informant for the pro for a while to see what kind of cooperation that he can really come up with. ESPN legal analyst Roger Cossack with the latest from Washington, D.C. Fourteen years ago, the most controversial athlete in America was Charles Barkley for saying athletes shouldn't be role models. The Hall of Famer later admitted he was one, like it or not. Vic's status as a role model seems inevitably tarnished. Sir Charles expressing both empathy and scorn for Vic on ESPN News today. Well, it's unfortunate uh, for everybody. It's, it's, a, it's obviously bad for sports. 
I feel bad because he's a jock, but he did it to himself, and that's unfortunate. All right, baseball. Yeah, do you hear what White Sox manager Ozzie Gian said after being swept in a pair by Boston yesterday, 21 to 4 combined score? Quote, 12 hours of my life I wasted, and I'm not going to get it back. <laughs> uh, he's wasting it today as oh, well. This, this isn't going to help, is it? <laughs> they are now in the top of the eighth inning, 10 to nothing. The Red Sox leading the White Sox, trying to stretch that lead out. Uh, in the East, uh, it's already stretched out to six and a half over the Yankees. Yankees, who lost to Detroit in a rain hampered affair, which ended at 3.30 this morning, get going at 7.05 tonight. We'll get into that with Buster only a little bit later on Sports Center. Mets up 4 2 on the Dodgers, top of the eight. Mets have won El Duque's last eight starts, and he's shutting down LA so far. David Wright, pair of singles, pair of walks, an RBI and a run. And Carlos Delgado with a two run single in the fifth. He needed that. He was 0 for his last 16 coming into the game. All of golf's biggest names but Tiger are there, but Phil Mickelson, one of only two big names, still in contention after three rounds at the Barclays Classic. Highlights for moving days straight ahead. And that's the beginning of golf's take on NASCAR's chase for the cup. After Bristol tonight, just two more races till the cutoff. That and more when SportsCenter puts the pedal to the metal. Next. Each way would shoot a 70 and stay at 13 under for the tournament. How about Justin Rose? At the par 3 14, 140 yards to depend. And Rose with the nine iron. Can I do this once in my life, please? Oh, wow. The ace, hole in one. First hole in one of the tournament. He shot a one under 70. Rose at five under. Phil Mickelson with a double bogey on 16. Has birdie putt on 17. Mickelson from about 25 feet knocks it down. He birdies the last two holes, finishes with a two under par 69. And Steve Stricker, birdie putt. To take the lead, drains that Stricker with a third a third round leader at 14 under one stroke ahead of Choi as they head in to Sunday. Other side of the country, San Francisco for the quarterfinals and semis of the U.S. Amateur Championship where a top two finish gets you into the U.S. Open and traditionally an invite into the Masters. This is Colt Nost from Dallas on the par 3 15. Not quite as good as Justin Rose, but pretty good. He advances to the championship against the winner of Casey Clendenden, Sinlinden, John Sinlinden, or Michael Thompson. This is Thompson on the par 5 16th. All you got to do is two putt to have the hole and win the match. And the Tucson, Arizona native does that. So it'll be Thompson against Nost tomorrow. They'll play 36 holes to determine the champion. You are forgiven if you missed the end of the Tigers and Yankees game last night slash this morning. Eight and a half hours it took. Mm. The impact on the wild card race next to Buster only. Plus, when you jam 43 drivers going 115 miles per hour into a half mile oval, road rage sure to follow. Golf update brought to you by Anil and Elston Howard of the 1962 Yankees. And it continued last night into this morning. Yanks and Tigers, after a four hour rain delay, the Umps decide to play the game. And Roger Clemens serving it up. Hagler Ordonez, 25th jack of the season. Clemens giving up a season high six earned runs in five innings. Top three, A Rod. He's trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. His 43rd homer of the season. The only time the crowd really booed was when they announced that they were canceling the postgame fireworks because of the city's noise ordinance. That goes <laughs> Fourth inning, Curtis Granderson. How about his day? Two triples, four hits. Becomes the seventh player with 20 triples in a season since 1947. First Tiger since Ty Cobb in 1917. Top of the fifth. We're still nowhere near done. Yanks down a run. The decade might see ya. Ties the game at six. Jorge Posada scores. We go to the 11. Two on, two out for Carlos Guillen. And Sean Hen on the mound and give him the body bag, Shawnee. Eight and a half hours after they scheduled the start of this game, 9 6 the final score, dropping the Yanks three games behind Seattle in the AL wild card race. Eight and a half hours. If you bought the ticket in Detroit and you stuck around 3 <laughs> 30 in the morning before you finished, ESPN the magazine senior writer Buster only joining us now to talk about this game and its impact on the wild card race. But first, how about the longest game you've ever seen? You know, I got a good one for you. <laughs> 1990, I was covering, covering the AAA Nashville Sounds for the Nashville Banner, and they play one game playoff against Buffalo, 18 innings on a Monday night, and that wasn't the longest game I saw because three days later, the Sounds played a 20 inning game against the Omaha Royals. Rain delays, it got done at 4. 30 in the morning. Oh, that's a dedicated beat writer who's sticking around <laughs> for that game. Us in the TV business, we get the highlights and, and bolt after the third inning. <laughs> so we got Chen Ming Wong and Jeremy Bonnerman tonight. 
Now, both clubs used five relievers up until 3.30 this morning. So who needs a quality start more, Jimmy Leland or Joe Torre? Joe Torre, without question, because the Yankees' margin for error is absolutely slipping, and the big key is they need to get better, more consistent starting pitching. You look at the margins now. It looks like they're going to be seven games out as they start their game behind the Boston Red Sox. Boston's magic number is down to 27. Four games behind Seattle in the loss column. They absolutely need to start stepping it up. And it's not only tonight, but Monday when Mike Messina starts. He may be pitching for his job. Keagawa could take over for him. So this is a big key for the Yankees down the stretch. They have the offense. Can they get the starting pitching? You talk about Monday, the big series, not just on the East Coast, but how about the Angels who go to Seattle on Monday? The Mariners just a, a game back after beating Texas 4-2 to two last night. Their eighth straight game with double-digit hits. Yep. Another three ahead of the Yankees in the wild card race. If you're an Angels fan, why should the Mariners style of play scare you? Depth. I mean, that's a big underrated part of what Seattle has right now is depth. They have depth in the rotation since Jeff Weaver started turning his season around early in the year. And their offense is much deeper than anyone expected. Think about this number. They have nine guys with more than 50 RBIs. They're the first team to do that after 126 games since the Boston Red Sox of 2003, which is one of the great offensive teams of all time. So this is a Seattle team that has deep, deep lineup, deep starting pitching, and is, has a pretty good bullpen, too. And they're 20 games above 500 for the first time in four years. How about the uh, Indians? CC Sabathia losing to the Royals last night 2-1. to one. Now, he says to the media he's not frustrated, but he's got one win in his last seven starts despite a 2-1-3 ERA in those starts. Uh, do baseball folks still believe in the Tigers more than the Tribe because of that hitting? No, I don't think so. I think they're real concerns about the Tigers because of their starting pitching. Uh, you know, there's a real question of whether or not the Tigers have suffered a physical hangover from last year with that deep run they went in the playoffs. Where you have the Angel, uh, we have the, uh, the Indians, they are struggling offensively, but they've got Jake Westbrook turning it around now between him and Fausto Carmona and CC Sabathia. Indians pitching wise are in better shape than Detroit is going down the stretch. Yeah, the Tigers have the hitting. Uh, you know, they're going to need Gary Sheffield back, but they need their pitching to bounce back. They are a game and a half behind the Cleveland Indians in the Central as we speak. How about the National League? You get the Padres, winners of three straight. They lead the wild card and now just two games shy of Arizona in the NL West. When you talk to scouts around the game, what are they saying about what's going to decide that division? The question is, will the San Diego Padres score a lot of runs? And there's no doubt that since Milton Bradley rejoined the lineup this week, he's made a huge difference. They've scored 36 runs in the four games of the current road trip that started in New York, and now they're in Philadelphia. They've gotten double-digit hits in four straight games. That's the big question about the Padres. Can they hit? We know they have the great starting pitching. Jake Peavy, Chris Young, presumably when he comes back, Greg Maddox. This is a team that if it puts together a lot of runs, it's going to be very dangerous, not only in the West race, but also in the National League, maybe going to the World Series. Padres in Philadelphia again tonight, and the Diamondbacks still hosting the Cubs in a potential playoff preview. The head scratcher yesterday before the umpires in Detroit decided to play that game at about <laughs> 11 o'clock local time was the Braves designating Bob Whitman for the assignment. I mean, this is a guy 20 saves, ERA under three for the month of August. Who closes now for Atlanta? Well, what they're looking at is probably giving Rafael Soriano the opportunity to close out games. Maybe, maybe Peter Moylan, when, because he's having a terrific rookie season. They got Octavia Dotel coming off the disabled list at some time. Here's what it came down to with Bob Wickman. Performance. He had a 7-7-1 ERA on the road. But also, he wasn't the most popular guy in that clubhouse. And it's a clubhouse that has very high accountability. Players respect each other, demand a lot of each other. And Bob Wickman had been complaining about pitching in non-safe situations. He lost that game. We see on, on, on the screen right there, giving up a walk-off home run to Adam Dunn. He complained about pitching a non-safe situation. That does not fit the culture of the team. That's why Bobby Cox said, we're looking to do something different. Braves in St. Louis. Tim Hudson looking for his career-best 10th straight win. Buster Only, we appreciate you joining us on SportsCenter. We'll see you on baseball tonight at 1 a.m. Eastern. Thanks, Steve. As we mentioned earlier, the next Tell Cups of Grasshopper, the clear-cut favorite, wins. The Travis Gates. Dodgers and Mets, it is over. Mets had won El Duque's last eight starts. Carlos Delgado, no hits in his last 17 at bats. But in the fourth inning, first inning rather, bottom of the uh, first, struggles continue. 
El Duque again. Mets 8-0 in his last eight starts. ZRA under three in those. Jeff Kent goes down. Luis Gonzalez with the high cheese. El Duque retiring 12 in a row at one point. Bottom of the fifth. Delgado up. Bases loaded. You know the New York fans are all over him if he strikes out, right? Two out. That's a sweet swing. Just drive it to center field. Get the legs behind you. Get your legs into it. 0 for 19 slump is snap like that. Mets go up three zip. Top seven, Russell Martin up, down a couple of runs. Fernandez goes sidearm, and that was a mistake. Martin sort of ricochet shot. Dodgers within a run. Top eight, Juan Pierre up at bat. Four, six, three. Mets win the game. Got a question in Cleveland football wise is will the starting quarterbacks. Casey Kane won last night's Bush race at Bristol Motor Speedway. He'll try to double up tonight on the Nextel circuit. Coverage about six minutes away in Tennessee. Tennessee. All American uh, final in the men's draw tonight of the Pilot Pen, the final tune up to the U.S. Open, which starts Monday. And it's two the best friends against each other James Blake against Marty Fish. First time they've ever faced off in a final. It's going to be some great tennis in Connecticut. WNBA playoff action. San Antonio trying to even up their best of three first rounder with Sacramento. Becky Hammett and her crew trying to get their first ever home postseason win. First quarter, Hammett driving, fade away, good. And then the second quarter, look at the deep three ball she's able to ring up. So San Antonio going up by 15 later in the second. Hammond goes for a little drive into the lane. Puts the layup up and in. 39-21 San Antonio. Hammond, 15 for 20 points in the first half. San Antonio wins. She's got a fever. <laughs> in the East, game two of the 2-3 matchup. The third seed, the Sun, defeated the fever in triple overtime. Game one Thursday. Anna DeForge, 31 points in that game and took over this game early. I'm going to show you a thing or two about going one-on-one. -on -one. Get 15 points in the first half. Beaver 0 for 5 against the Sun this year. And then one more time, the Forge. The Forge can't, it's not just that she can take it to the rack, she can shoot as well. 3, 2, 1, contact. 26 points for the Forge. Beaver running away with it, still in the third quarter. Tamika catchings. 15 points, 13 boards. Series tied at 1, game 3, Monday night in Indianapolis. What to watch for tonight, NFL Ravens and Redskins, Battle of the Beltway and Battle of the Landrys. LaRon, Washington's first round pick this year, and his big brother, Dewan, the fifth round pick last year by Baltimore. Both are safety, so if they meet, it'll probably be on a kick. Bonnie Bernstein with more. Preseason's wrapping up at the NFL, but we've got the field on Saturday night. And Dolphins fans, you want to check out ESPN.com because John Clayton is claiming that your team's got to pick up the pace, that Trent Green is not up to speed, and Ronnie Brown looking less than special so far. All right, we've got IndyCar racing coming up tomorrow. Motorola Indy 300 at Sonoma. Dario Franchitti on the pole. Danica Patrick, though, starting in the second spot. Coverage on ESPN 330 tomorrow. That, that ties her for her highest starting spot. Maybe that wins. And coming up here, a NASCAR countdown on ESPN. You got tennis on ESPN 2, next Sports Center, 11:30 Eastern. And of course, you can always stay current with ESPN News. For Fred Hickman, I'm Steve Bunin. Thanks for watching Sports Center. Anything else? That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Welcome to Thunder.